Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's forum presentation, Restriction, Repetition, Result, a Minimalist ap Approaches in Art and Music. My name is Adeline Wong, and I'm a composer and a senior lecturer at the Yong Sutil Conservatory of Music. Today we have a guest speaker, Adrian George, who is the director of exhibitions at Art Science Museum Singapore. I wanted to invite Adrian to co-present with me, given how we met in 2018 and collaborated in the Minimalism Exhibition at Art Science Museum. Today's presentation will focus on the use of limited materials and repetition in minimalist art and music. Adrian will start off by sharing the origins of minimalism in art and also share with us some of the artworks that was featured in the exhibition in, in 2018. And I will continue in the second half of the presentation on my use of limited materials and repetition in my own composition and research. And of course, after that, we will take some questions from the listeners after our presentation. So please welcome Adrian. Over to you, Adrian. Thank you so much, Adeline. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this conversation. And thanks to the team here at the Conservatory for making it all possible. Uh, so Adeline and I first met through a mutual friend. I was carrying out some research into minimalist music, and I approached my friend to ask for her advice, but she in turn recommended that I speak with Adeline. And when I met Adeline, uh, I realized that there was an immediate synchronicity. Adeline fully understood where I was going with my exhibition research, and I ended up including one of Adeline's compositions in the exhibition, Minimalism, Space Light Object. So today I'm going to speak a little bit about that exhibition, where it came from, and how, how it has affected my understanding and appreciation of different types of music and music creation. But I'm going to start with a little introduction into where minimalism comes from. It's generally accepted that minimalism as an art movement was born in the United States in the middle of the 20th century. And strictly, yes, that's true. However, the movement was really forged by curators and art historians who sought to give a collective term to a group of artists, poets and musicians who were creating work using a specific set of conditions and resulting in very clear and identifiable aesthetic. The artists themselves were never really keen on the term and some even argued against it, but let's put that to one side. The consensus is, or was, that minimalism is a Western artistic construct. In 2016, I made an exhibition in Beijing that looked at the work of artists whose practice could be described as minimalist. And it was during the research for that show that I began to look really closely at the links between minimalism and Asian philosophies. And I started to uncover some quite extraordinary things. My investigations led back to the Rig Vedic texts. I'm sure some of you will know of these texts. But for those of you who may not, um, these are texts which were written in an ancient form of Sanskrit around 1500 to 2000 years BC and to date not all of them have been translated. <clears throat> However, a lot of the texts that have been translated speak of nothingness, absence, and the void, the nothingness that existed before all other things existed. These are deep philosophical ideas that form the basis of both Buddhism and Hinduism and are in turn uh, underpinning both yogic teachings and Zen. So what you are seeing here is an Enzo. That's an ink circle painted in a single brush stroke. Monks would often be asked to paint these forms over and over again as part of their meditation practices. The Enzo takes on many meanings. The circle of life, the void, endless, endlessness, and a reminder of the constant struggle towards perfection, which is, of course, unattainable. The Japanese monk, uh, Sengai Gibbon, born in the middle of the 18th century, would have been taught to paint an Enzo. However, Sengai Gibbon was also quite a quirky and unusual monk, and he often painted himself looking like a rock with a moustache, or sometimes even as a frog monk. So this is one of Sengai Gibbon's self-portraits. 
There are many such as this in the archive of the temple where he lived out most of his life. <clears throat> and then one day, after a considerable period of time in meditation, Sengai Gibbon painted this ink painting titled The Universe, and it includes three basic geometric shapes, the square, the triangle, and the circle. This is so odd and so different from everything that he had made before and far from anything any other Japanese monk had been painting. No one really knows what inspired Sengai Gibbon to create it. It, it. it has, however, become an incredibly important work of art. Decades later, the minimalist artist Walter de Maria created this sculpture that is obviously linked to Sengai Gibbon's ink painting. But how could this American artist know about a Buddhist monk born in Japan almost 200 years before de Maria was born? Well, that's a good question, but let's leave that question hanging for a moment and we'll come back to it later. We are now looking at one of the world's most famous so-called minimalist artworks by Kazimierz Valimich, uh, Black Square it's titled. It actually predates the minimalist movement by at least 35 years and is more accurately referred to as his suprematist work. Malevich had started his career as a figurative and landscape painter and had become quite successful in those genres. However, he started to become fascinated by mysticism and es esotericism and studied with Russian gurus who had traveled extensively in the East and were spreading ideas they had learned of simplicity and reductivism across to the West. Working towards the principle of removing the unnecessary or superfluous from his paintings, Malevich reached the point whereby he removed everything and was left with nothing, which he then represented in the form of a black painting. These are the two men who had a direct influence on Malevich's interest in, in mysticism. Malevich's work in turn, inspire, in turn inspired one of minimalism's most well-known artists, Donald Judd. We will return to Donald Judd's work later, and actually I'm sure that in our conversation later, Adeline, we will discuss Judd's work a little further. A few decades after Malevich created the Black Square, ideas of nothingness and the Vedic roots of Buddhism were being disseminated across Europe and the US, this time through a series of lectures at Columbia University given by the Japanese Zen Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki. These lectures had a profound influence not only on the visual arts but also on architecture, music, performance, theatre, fashion and interior design. It's fair to say then that minimalism, which reached its high point in the 50s and 60s in New York, has its roots planted firmly in the East, with the ideas of simplicity and reductivism that had been brought to the West via Suzuki's Zen Buddhist teachings and Gurdjieff's mysticism inspired by his understanding of Hinduism. Two of the best known names directly associated with the birth of minimalism in the US, particularly in relation to music or sound, are John Cage and Toshi Ichinagi. Ichinagi moved to the US to attend Juilliard with his then wife, Japanese banking heiress, experimental musician and artist Yoko Ono. They quickly became part of New York's avant-garde scene and their Soho loft became a home to the Fluxus movement. They were close friends with John Cage, who I'm sure you all know, and often collaborated with him, sometimes formally, sometimes informally, on performances or happenings, as they were then called. All three of them attended Suzuki's lectures at Columbia. And it was around this time that art historians, curators and arts writers started to refer to the specific aspects of works of art and musical composition that seemed to connect a diverse group of artists and artworks together. These are the criteria that came to define what we understand today as minimalism. So I'm just going to run through uh, six of these criteria and try and explain them a little bit with some examples from the exhibition of which Adeline's composition was included. 
So what we're looking at now are four images by the Chinese artist Zhou Hongbin. So she created these sculptures in three-dimensional form, photographed them, and then destroyed the sculpture. So what she was really working with are the essential ideas of simple geometry. And this stretches right back to Sengai Gibbon's uh, ink painting, the idea is that simple forms, the simplest of forms, can create the most beautiful of images. There's also a hint at this something we'll come back to later, which is around ephemerality, but we'll get onto that in due course. So this particular image is by the Thai artist Tuwachai Pontesawazdi. It's a very, very simple form which hides a very complex idea. Uh, it's a geometric shape, but it's based on, um, <clears throat> on a planet uh, which is pulled in, in, into this ovoid shape by the gravity which it's being subjected to by other planets around it. So simple forms repeated are seen in the work of uh, Donald Judd. <clears throat> in this instance, there are two issues that we're dealing with. First of all, it's repetition, and repetition is something that really is, uh, is what Adeline's going to talk about later, but also the use of base materials or industrial materials. Uh, it also refers to the idea that the object is in a building and refers to the space around it. So in this case, you see the Judd cubes are sort of reflecting the space in which they exist. <clears throat> so disappointingly, despite being so forward-thinking in many respects, the art world was still, in the 1950s and 60s in New York, a very male-orientated art world. Mary Miss, an artist working with large-scale objects, was very much overlooked when it came to the gallery representation and museum support at the time. So she presented her work in the public realm, outdoors, or in spaces that were definitely not white cube gallery spaces. <clears throat> Here we see a series of fences built on a landfill site in New York. Each fence has a hole cut in it, but as you can see, the hole appears to descend into the ground. This is intended to direct an intangible column of air into the earth. So here we see repetition, the natural environment, a barren landscape, and bare material. The covering of snow kind of emphasizes this uh, barren uh, environment. And absence and nothingness is also present in this invisible column of air that seems to be uh, descending into the earth. So in this work by the Hong Kong artist Morgan Wong, repetition is approached in two very different ways. One is performative. So Morgan has been filing an iron bar with the aim of making a needle for years. This is a reenactment of the Chinese idiom that if you work hard enough, you can file an iron bar into a needle. As he works, he collects the metal filings and places the filings in tiny glass needles. These are identical and placed on an increasing number of white pedestals and displayed as seen in the image here. There is the repetition of the process and the repetition of the objects as seen presented in the space. Base materials are also very important and these can be industrial or everyday materials or natural materials. Here we see an artwork by Mona Hatoum, uh, predominantly made with sand. There's about 750 kilos of sand in this work. Um, and uh, it's reminiscent of a Zen garden. And in this case, the motorized armature creates a raked effect on one side and on the other side simultaneously flattens the sand in an endless cycle of cre creation and erasure. This work by British artist Richard Long um, is, sees a transformation of the natural environment into the, into the gallery space. Long's early works involved him walking repeatedly back and forth in a straight line in a field of grass, flattening the grass, and in so doing, temporarily marking the terrain. A few days later, the grass would recover, and his, and his action, and the line that he drew in the landscape, would be erased. For this particular work in the museum, he uh, relocated 258 stones 
to create a stone circle that literally brings the simplicity of nature into the pared-down white's cube architecture of the museum and simple geometry. So earlier on, I mentioned Donald Judd in relation to Kazimir Malevich. Judd actually had written about how much of an influence Malevich had been on his uh, early career. It is often thought that a minimalist aesthetic requires a limited color palette of black, white, gray, or neutral earth tones, but this is not strictly the case. Uh, artists often use base materials which come with a variety of, of finishes, particularly metals, which might be uh, brassy or silvery colored or metallic, in some way metallic, copper, aluminium, even mirror finishes are all seen quite differently in the, and quite often in the minimalist oeuvre. In this instance, the arch minimalist Judd returns to his use of bold co color by having stuck to a fixed palette of readily available industrial paints and a specific formula that he applies in order to arrange the color blocks in a specific order. Much like Mary Miss, Carmen Herrera was making significant work within a, minimal within a minimalist aesthetic at the same time as Judd, and like Miss, Herrera was also overlooked by the male-dominated art scene at the time. At 86 years old, she still paints every day and is finally getting the recognition she ad uh, deserves with these hard-edged geometric abstract paintings. I mentioned earlier that even mirror surfaces are used to create minimalist artworks, and this image, and in this image, it's clear why. So these works, uh, these cube forms created by Robert Morris, almost disappear into the space they inhabit. They reflect the space around them, blending in, almost denying their own presence. However, they reassert themselves when someone or some other object is in the space as the other objects, or we as viewers, are reflected in the surface, implicating us in the work. What are these items, though? For Morris, it is simply a mirrored cube. There is no illusion no hidden narrative, they are what they are, mirrored cubes. The Chinese artist Zhang Yu begins his practice with base materials, in this case rice paper and ink. He takes the simple geometric shape of the cube, here in a transparent acrylic form, and through performative repetition, which we mentioned previously in regards to Morgan Wong's work, the pouring of the ink over and over along across several days creates a black cube of paper through the absorption of the ink the simplest means the simplest action there is no comment in his work about any form of alchemical transformation or the sublime his work is what it is a process and an ink black pile of paper The final aspect of minimalism that I would like to discuss is the ephemeral, that which exists for a brief moment in time. Here the Chinese artist Song Dong is seen walking the lanes of a Beijing hutong pouring boiling water from a large kettle. Basic everyday materials are used. He repeats the action. But in this case, the evidence of the action is lost as the stream as the steam dissipates and the water slowly evaporates. The Taiwanese artist Cha Wei Sai takes us almost back to the beginning of my presentation. Here she is seen painting an Enzo on the surface of a block of ice. As the ice melts, the ink becomes diluted by the melt water and is slowly washed away from the block of ice making a blank space once again for the artist to repeat the action. Again, repetition, simple geometry, and the, ephemeral, and the ephemeral meet in this hypnotic work. So I mentioned earlier in this presentation that Toshi Ichinagi and John Cage would make another appearance in my talk. This is because their works will be included in my upcoming exhibition that focuses on the relationship between art, sound, and music. 
Titled Orchestral Maneuvers, the exhibition will bring some extraordinary works by the leading sound artists of our generation. And I'm just going to quickly uh, run through some of them to give you a teaser for the upcoming exhibition, but also to act a little bit as a bridge into uh, Adeline's presentation. So the exhibition, Orchestra Maneuver, Sound, Art and Music, really began its life in the work of the Italian futurists who in the early 1900s developed new types of instruments known as the intonoromuri, or noise-making machines. But as I developed the idea, things changed a bit. And I want to give you a very short preview of some of the artworks that you'll see and hear in the exhibition. So this work is by the British artist Hannah Perry, who explores how sound can affect the environment we are in. Here, a synthetic skin is made to vibrate as a consequence of the deep bass sounds being played through a series of speakers attached to the back of the sinuous forms in the space. This work uh, I first presented in 2003. It's by Janet Cardiff, Canadian artist, and George Burroughs Miller. It's an epic work titled 40 Part Motet. Uh, its presentation in Tate Liverpool in the UK was the first uh, time it had been seen in Britain and resulted in the piece being partially gifted to Tate. I had first experienced the work in New York in 2001 and I had found it to be an incredibly emotional and deeply moving experience. To create this work, Cardiff uh, collaborated with the choir of Salisbury Cathedral to record Thomas Tallis's motet Spare Minalium. Each voice sings one of the 40-part harmonies and was recorded separately. And as a listener, you will be fully immersed in the choral experience like you will never have experienced it before. You can listen to the whole choir singing at or to or for you, and you can choose perhaps to listen to just one voice as you can position yourself closer to one speaker or another. This is impossible to do in a normal choral setting. So this artwork by British artist Mel Brimfield is a self-playing piano or pianola. Uh, its title is a direct reference to Cage's most well-known compositions, 4 minutes 33 seconds, which, as you all know, is a so-called silent work. However, Brimfield's pianola has a specially commissioned score that is supposedly based on the footfall of our athletes from the 1952 Helsinki Olympics. The work itself has an incredible presence. It is really a performer, and I guess to some extent you will see that it is if you come to visit the exhibition. Of course, I was fascinated by the idea of experimental scores and different ways of recording music. The pianola role is just one example, a roll of punched paper that provides the instructions so that the piano mechanism knows what to play. For me, the score is both a complexification only readable by those with the ability to understand the musical codes, and it is also a container for sound and a way of holding it. Music sits within the score. Scores are also performance instructions, allowing the performer the opportunity to interpret. Just think of Cage's work, for example. More often than not, they are instructions on how to play not what to play. I began to think about the uh, ubiquity of the Western notation system, and I began to research different ways of notating music. The earliest form of musical notation can be found in a cuneiform tablet that was created in Nippur in Babylonia, today's Iraq, in about 1400 BC. Of course, these are incredibly fragile and cannot be lent, so we have a series of other images lent from the Shoyan collection, which is based in Oslo and London. These include Vedic notation based on hand gestures, Japanese lute music notation, and various other forms that you can see on the slide. So on the left here, you see a page from the experimental score by Toshi Ichiganagi. He has turned the stave on its side, and the score carries a great similarity to one of the methods that was used to record dance and movement prior to the invention of the video camera. On the right-hand side, you can see a short section of Laban notation. I guess the score provides the perfect opportunity for me to hand the baton over to Adeline. 
as it was Adeline's work, Herringbone, presented as part of the minimalism exhibition that really inspired me to think about music as the basis for my next exhibition. So thank you for that, Adeline, and it's, it's over to you. Thank you, Adrian, for that wonderful presentation. And watching your slides really brings back lot of, lots of good memories of the exhibition that was almost three years ago. And some of the artworks from the presentation really had a huge impact on how I viewed structure and material as I um, continue my uh, research into repetition. For me, in the past few years, I've been using very little material, very basic material. So I would like to use as little as possible. So following the uh, minimalist approach, I know Adrian gave us so many um, wonderful examples of using basic material, simple materials. It's the same for me. In my music, I like to use as little as possible because with this minimum amount of materials, I'm able to oops, achieve as much as possible. And for me, with the minimal amount of material given, I like to create complexities out of my music. And there's this particular artwork that I discovered by Yayoi Kusama which really reflects what I feel in the way I um, envision my music. So let's have a look at this. This is the uh, Infinity Net series by Yayoi Kusama. As you can see here, it's a repetitive motion of just dots. And it's used repeatedly, obviously. But with this repetition and its final product of the artwork, for me, it creates a whole different dimension to the work. I find it to be a lot of complexities here. As you look at it, it's got lots of depth. It's almost like a net for me, um, which it says here, the Infinity Net series. So for me, it's similar to how I view, um, it was actually Donald Judd, uh, which, you know, it was mentioned, the artist Donald Judd, that said this about the work, being complex and simple at the same time. And I was very drawn to just this statement. So for me, like this artwork with repet repetitive motion, it's simple and complex at the same time. I would like to um, play a few works now from um, some, well, mainly Steve Reich's work. Actually, Steve Reich's music was the first work that I heard as a student. Um, 
influencing me in how I view repetition to be part of my composition process. And I still remember I was um, at Eastman at that time as a student. I listened to music for 18 musicians. And it's a really long work. And it's about just under an hour. But the involvement you are in while listening to this long, um, wonderful work is just very emotional because after the entire world ends, you've got this absorption of so much sound in you. And when it finally stops, it really um, made a huge difference. And I wanted to do that in my music as well, where you know there is a kind of build-up using simple material to create that kind of um, continuous movement and as a result, complexity in my case. So let's um, look at this very famous work by Steve Reich. I'm sure a lot of y'all will know this. It's the piano phase. As you can see here, uh, let me just try. This is the basic material here. And um, Reich wanted to find a new way of working with repetition as a musical technique. So let's just listen to this. I think it's easier when we actually listen to this piece. to cut you off there but um, if as you can see the first piano part does not move the notes are exactly the same and it's tempo as you can see it's exactly the same but in the second piano notes are also exactly the same where we stopped just now um, it came back to around this part here and this area here is where I find to be the most interesting where it gradually phases slowly into a different um, acceleration. And then it comes to the F sharp here, which is the second note that kind of coordinates with the first note of the first um, pianist. And this process just keeps going on. If we keep going, it has 12 phases. And finally, after all these notes are, are done, there's 12 notes here all together, the end of the work comes back to the opening here where everyone, the two pianists are in sync again. And here, the process of gradually shifting phase relationships between two or more identical patterns is really fascinating. Instead of a melody, Reich has used a motif or a pattern, a very short pattern. And instead of a certain rhythmic distance, you have a flexible distance in changing. So in experiencing process music like this by Steve Reich, the listener's task is one of discovery, which is what I found um, and what I discovered as a student, and one that affects the listener's interaction with the process. I mean, you know, whether you enjoy it or you don't, there's definitely an impact in the process after you've gone through this phase. So this is um, one of the pieces that was very much um, uh, 
important to me when I was thinking about uh, repetition. Now, a similar piece is another favorite composer of mine is Ligeti. In this particular piece, um, as you can look at the score and um, the title continuum, you can see that it's just a continuous sound that is created here. So um, before we listen to it, I mean, just take a moment to just observe and just look at the score and imagine what sounds you're going to get. And the indication of the tempo here is prestissimo, and it's written for the harpsichord, even though it's also been transcribed to other instruments to be played. And um, for Ligeti, this is what he had to say about the piece. The entire process is a series of sound impulses in rapid succession which create the impression of continuous sound. For me, um, well, let's just listen to it first. Okay, here we go. Yes, as you can hear, um, there is a repetitive movement. But this is somewhat a little different than Steve Reich's, where it is creating a continuous um, sound. And for me here, the um, texture is really important as it creates density in the texture. And um, this reminds me very much of the Yayoi Kusama paint, painting that we saw earlier. Let me just go back to it. More, yeah, where you know it for me, it's almost like a net, um, you know. And the Getty, well, when he wrote that work, it was during his um, phase called the micro polyphony, and some uh, musicologists has also described it as being net structures. And um, if we go back to the score. So it starts with this two note idea, the B flat and G in the right hand and G and B flat on the left hand. It's the same notes, but it slowly adds in more notes as we go along, thicker into three, into four, into five. And where we just stopped just now, it became this pattern here, where it slowly comes back to a trill two note figure like how we started. And this um, process continues you know, and we get this whole continuous um, sound that is created here, which creates a lot of um, density to the texture. So together with Kusama's infinity net painting that I mentioned, this exemplifies that the rudimentary notion of repetitive movements, which is used in both works, it results in a pattern. And this gradual accumulation of the lush textures, both in Kusama's painting and Ligeti's work um, of patterns, it's derived from the patterns of repetition. And this culminates into the entire structure of the work. I mean, if we continue listening to Ligeti's, Ligeti's work, which is not too long. Um, so yes, yeah, so this definitely um, had a huge inspiration when I'm also trying to create repetition in my own works. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the last work that I would like to show you before I move on to my own work is okay, how do we get there? Is by um, 
a German composer, Pope. And um, just now, Adrian mentioned about the um, cuneiform relating to the wedge-shaped characters used in ancient writing systems um, in Mesopotamia. Um, here, you know, we, we should just look at the, this cuneiform, where it's all using just wedge shape. I mean, it's just beautiful just looking at it. And the shapes, they're not identical, but there are similarities in it. Some are, you know, you know, of course I don't understand what it means, but by just looking at this um, image, it, I can just imagine how the composer um, imagined his music to be using repetition as well. But in this case, it's using ornamentation to the original um, melody here. So if we look at this piece by Pope, you can see that, you know, I have bracketed those um, red or blue. We start with this very simple melody and you see another layer on top here. It's actually derived from the same melody but in different rhythmic patterns and it's almost very ornamental. So this is in bar 12 when it finally comes in but we will listen to the um, beginning of this work. It's for orchestra. So in this, um, I mean, it's just a very short extract of the entire piece, which is about uh, 15 minutes or so. You can just hear how the um, varying, varying repetitions are used on the same melody. All right, we start with the longer note value ones. And the melody expands and contracts in relative proportions and permutations along with varying degrees of ornamentation here. So yes, another thing that I learned about uh, using repetition is ornamentation or sometimes you know we can call it varied repetition. So here um, are three works that I find to be of inspiration in the way repetition is handled very differently. And for my own process in composition in, in recent years I have a, um, I use repetition, and that's the idea, the basic idea that I have. And from repetition, it, it, the idea that I have is being repeated and it becomes a pattern. This pattern can be a motif, it can be a short melody, anything it can be. And um, this forms for me the texture. And finally, the accumulation of this pattern, all right, uh, to the texture, it becomes the structure of the entire work. And for me, it applies to micro aspect as well as the larger aspect of um, the way I've um, composed in a series of pieces, which I will um, talk about in a moment. So back to the piece that um, Adrian included in the minimalist uh, minimalism exhibition back in 2018. Yes, there is repetition, as you can see this here. But at the same time, I'm trying to find my own way of um, my own interpretation and my own technique of using repetition, which I definitely was inspired by the minimalist movement. But I'm trying to create something new here using 
an idea that was used. I mean, we can talk about repetition from ancient music. You know, that that's something so old, but I try to do something different with it. And um, yeah, so perhaps in this work, um, you may be able to hear some of the um, irregularities, <coughs> unlike the minimalist um, pieces like um, Reich and so forth. So why don't I just play the first two pages for you? Um, where is my <coughs> person? Yeah. That's the uh, opening um, minute or so of the, the piece. Yeah, that, that was where we stopped just now. So here, the repetition um, that I have here, obviously, as you can hear, it was the repeated note, which was the F. And from that F, we have the so-called herringbone motif, which I will explain because it actually refers to a, another piece um, in the cycle which is, you know, you heard just now, this repeated note idea. And this then, this repeated note idea then has this um, short motif. And this short motif then becomes a short, uh, sorry, this, well, it's not, yeah, I suppose it's a motif here, which becomes slightly longer to become a pattern here. This is something here, and let's listen to that. And with this, of course, it goes through lots of changes. I accumulate the texture from what happens from, um, from the beginning right up to the end of the piece. Oh, sorry, yes, yeah, so this is the herringbone pattern, um, yeah, where it has the shape going up and down and up and down. That's how I got the uh, idea for the title of the work. And this is towards the end of the work where you see, you know, the, the G is the repeated uh, note here. It's in a really high range of the piano and you can see it becomes very, very thick in terms of the texture from before. So this is a short excerpt from the last part of the piece. Oh. Yeah, so you know, that, that's the whole idea, I mean, in a very short um, explanation of that repeated note idea. And I have a motif, and this motif then becomes extended into a longer pattern. And with this pattern, I accumulate texture and energy. And finally, towards the end of the piece, where you know the whole range of the piano is used to, to, um, to end the entire work. So, the idea of repetition, pattern, and accumulation is used here in this um, piece, Herringbone. And while I was um, uh, composing this piece, so, you know, with the idea of repetition, I did not want it to be, well, I don't believe that, you know, repetition could always be the same. And while you have something being repeated, there is always a difference in terms of the next note, even though it's the same, it's always moving forward for me. And um, 
So how do you achieve unpredictability within a repetitive gesture? Remember the um, Kusama's painting of the Infinity Net series where simple and complex at the same time. So this is what I was thinking about. So I have something that is constant, which is the repetition. How do I create complexity so that it becomes rather unpredictable within a repetitive gesture? So in this piece, I created vertical sonorities, sharp, strong percussive chords, providing contrast to the moto perpetual texture that you heard earlier, almost like a toccata-like figure there. And um, this sound actually you heard in the beginning of the piece, even though there's no chords, but there were very um, subito forte passages, you know, breaking that flow of the re repetition. Ah. So let me look at the chords here. Yep. So throughout the piece, you'll see all these chords. Two, three. And if you look closely to this particular um, chord here, it's basically just a, a, another spelling of a diminished triad. Here you have open fourths, and here you have a cluster of notes here. So I have these three different sounds, a diminished, and then I have a... Um, open fourths, perfect fourths, and here is a cluster of notes, but you don't really hear them in that way throughout the piece. And here I use the chords as part of the texture of the repetition note C-sharp. And later on, when we're accumulating more um, textural complexities, those three chords in um, the previous example are used together, and you almost don't even hear it from the original chords, and then it moves back into um, that repeated note idea again. So that for me, that was one way to um, break away from the repetitive gesture, but at the same time, um, you know, we come back to it here, for example. And another way is to use textural complexities. There's a moment in the piece which was um, the pianist's favorite because it was really technically challenging to play this, this um, particular section. And that was what I was trying to do uh, here, is to create layers of um, lines in different registers and articulations. Uh, okay, here. Yeah, if you look at this um, particular, so the, the motif is still here, it's just, you know, it's, it's not within the minor second that you hear, it's, just, it's kind of more disconnected and disjunct here but it's the same motif, which is the herringbone motif. So we have it on the top register of the piano. And the second layer comes in where it's now all like a cluster. So from something quite wide spacing to something really small and like, like a cluster here. And that's the second texture that goes on and it's, it's improvisatory using those notes. And later on, this then becomes the same notes, but it's in a different articulation, very, very short. And after that goes on for a while, you have another layer here where it's the same motif but starting on a different note. But it's you know it's just um, the herringbone motif as well. But here it's in a longer note value, creating that kind of density of textures that I was relating to, almost like the um, continuum in Ligeti's work. But here you know with different articulation and note values, creating these uh, complexities here. So let's listen to this a little. creating textural um, complexities. So with that, um, you know, I, I, I kind of
kind of presented the last work in this um, series that I was talking about, where it's actually part of my five uh, series of five connected pieces. So here. I talked about how the repetition pattern accumulation, you, I, I use it in a micro level, so in a particular piece, for example, herringbone. But at the same time, it applies to a larger structure uh, of the macro level, which I would explain. So there's actually five connected pieces here. And how this works is the use of limited materials um, from the first uh, series, this is now um, used in the ending of a piece, and then it continues to begin in the beginning of the new piece. So the materials at the end of the piece will now begin the new uh, series. And it is this repetition of similar material and the organic circular quality, while at the same time being different and progresses forward to new instrumentation and texture for each piece. So you almost don't even realize that it's actually the same material. Hopefully, when you listen to it, you don't realize it. But it's um, because of the new instrumentation, that would definitely give a different um, perspective to the same material. And of course, the texture also changes in that new piece. So the piece that I was describing, Herringbone, is actually the third and central movement of this um, series of connected pieces, which I will continue. Yes, so the series starts with Interweaves that was in 2016. That's a string quartet. And then the second series is Nexus. It's a low brass quintet that was performed in Yong Siu To a few years back. And the one that I just demonstrated is Herringbone for piano solo. And the work now in progress is for tuba and string quartet, where the harmonies are taken from Herringbone. And finally, the fifth piece, which um, I have not completed, obviously, or started, is actually all the materials from the four pieces. And I use it almost, and I use it for all the instrumentation, so mainly four strings, the string quartet, Low brass, which is three, uh, I had the um, alto trombone, tenor, and bass trombone together with two tubas. And then the piano here. And here, you know, the string quartet is being featured together with the tuba, a very unusual combination of instrument here. And everyone plays at the last piece where it's accumulation of all the materials I've used from the four series um, of this larger structure of using repetition, patterns, and accumulation. So for me, I want to go back to one of the artworks that Adrian um, talked about earlier. Is this piece, um, this performative art piece, uh, Ink Feeding by Zhang Yu, whom I met at the um, exhibition in two, 2018. So here, if you look, the artist, and I saw the artist himself do it, was pouring black ink into this acrylic box filled with basic material, which is the very simple material, which is the rice paper. And as he performs this repetitive action, the ink slowly <laughs> absorbs into the rice paper, so from white rice paper, over a few days, I can't remember how many days it took to get it all completed into a total black box. So for me, um, you know, when I saw this, I mean, I started this series in 2016, and this exhibition was in 2018. It really um, had a huge um, lasting impression because for me, these repetitive actions are cumulative forces that resonate a deep significance in the entire structure. So for me, you know, that series that I talked about earlier Let's go back to that one. It's very much, you know, related to that kind of performative action we saw in Zhang Yu's um, repetition movement, where at the end, you know, the original idea is totally transformed, which is, you know, well, it's a white here, and with that pouring of ink, it slowly becomes black. It's totally transformed, and that's what um, I was thinking about when I, I first. Um, started the series. And so with that, having viewed this live as well was definitely um, extremely um, 
wonderful uh, to just see that in action and how it relates to how I was thinking with structure of my works. <coughs> so perhaps I should ju just um, you know, show you all and have a listen to what I mean here. So this is the ending of the first work of the series of the string quartet. And here, the, the rep repetitive note of E flat is played by the string quartet using Kolegno. Okay, let's just listen to this. flat fades away and the next series is or the second piece from the series is called Nexus for Lower Brass Quintet. As you can see in the notation it is almost taking that repeated element. It becomes a flutter tongue here with the mutes uh, changing open and close for the harmon mute. But of course it sounds so different because it's written for the Lower Brass Quintet and it's um, got all this very very um, quick changes of dynamic as well. <laughs> continues so you can hear that kind of fluttering uh, sound that I picked up and using the same note from the last uh, part of the string quartet into the new piece and this is the ending of the uh, low brass quintet piece so yeah here I've, I've kind of highlighted the herringbone motif herringbone motif because I knew that at the end of this uh, piece I was going to start the uh, piece for piano solo. So here you can already hear that motif and it ends with a B flat major chord here at the end. So just listen to this last part here. So that's the ending of the uh, Low Brass Quintet piece called Nexus. And this is what we heard earlier on. We'll just have just a very short uh, listen to it. So you can see that the F from the previous piece is now a repetitive F note. And the B flat major chord that I used at the ending just now, it's now it's here, but you don't really hear it until the next page. Um, because it's used using the sustenuto pedal to get the overtones um, to sound. So here we go. Ah. Okay. Yep, so that's the repeated F note.
so that's the B flat major chord. Yeah, and then this is the ending of Herringbone, where I talked about the accumulation of texture. Let's just listen to this part, and that begins the next uh, series. <laughs> That's the ending of Herringbone, and in the next new piece that I'm writing for tuba and string quartet, the repeated element of um, the previous work here is actually the chords that I use. I'll show you. And um, it's intentionally written for a slower uh, movement. After that kind of virtuosity in the piano piece, I wanted it to be totally contrasting and slowly, you know, gradually build up the, the um, energy again for the finale. So here it's a very slow work um, and very simple, as you can see those chords. And um, yes, it's just what's happening with the tuba. This sound called, uh, I'll play that for you in a, later on. But these are the chords from Herringbone. I've picked a few of them. And throughout the piece, you will hear the chords. So for example, this A chord from Herringbone, if you actually rearrange it, it's, um, it's just a major seventh chord. But if you hear it in this way of arrangement, this chord, it's very, very different from what it sounds like, the original. And this um, brings to this uh, work of art by Donald Judd Stacks, <laughs> where, um, you know, it, under different lighting, um, also the finish of the material, this object could be viewed very differently. And um, for me, when I was composing the tuba and um, string quartet piece, looking at these chords, for example, if you take chord A, it almost gives me an impression that the same material here, if you, you know, you c I, I kind of distribute it differently with different um, voice leading and different placement of notes. It sounds definitely very different from this, but it's the same material, it's the same notes. And this is what I'm trying to do for the tuba and string quartet work. I mean, you can already see it here. Um, this distribution of notes, and then it opens up slowly to something more open. And slowly, you know, it moves to the chord over here that is totally made up of fifths and very bare. For me, it's almost like creating sound objects I was uh, discussing with um, Adrian earlier on, where, you know, it's very different, even though it's the same material, looking at different lighting, you would perceive these um, objects very, very differently. And for me, it's the same with those um, chords that I created. You know, it's the same material, but different way of um, placing those notes. It almost makes it sound completely different. So yes, I'm um, just looking at the time. I should probably end my presentation. And as um, Adrian started his uh, presentation earlier, if you can remember with the Enzo, I would like to end my presentation with this work that also had a very um, huge impact on me when I saw this at the Minimalist Exhibition in Art Science Museum, where here um, there is repetition and there is, you know, here Richard Long is using the basic of materials, the stones here and the stones are repeated, so the material is being repeated, but every stone is of a different shape. And, you know, with this different shape, it's almost like me, you know, thinking of my music in terms of repetition. It does not have to be the same, and it is not the same. And it is um, accumulating that basic material. And like those series of pieces that I mentioned, it's a kind of organic, circular, um, quality that I I wanted to create in the series and having looked at this um, at the exhibition it was really very special to me and yes yeah, so with this 
I end my presentation and please give us a few minutes as we set up for the Q&A session. Thank you. Madeline, of course I'm going to ask you many questions <laughs> <laughs> about your process and about the end result, but um, I think I would like to start with this, this question about uh, repetition as the epitome of minimalism or silence as the kind of high point of minimalism. I think I know what your answer is going to be already, but maybe you can share a little bit with us about how you balance off notions of repetition and silence in your compositions. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Adrian. <laughs> well, like I um, explained earlier, for me, repetition uh, is used in corresponding with the basic material that I use in my pieces. So with the simplicity of materials, which is um, the basic idea or basic material, I repeat this basic idea. But for me, repetition um, is not just a process like the uh, minimalist um, composers, you know, of the uh, minimalist er uh, period, but rather doing something new in my own um, way of composing and for me, that is complexities. Mm. So I create all these complexities, and perhaps when, it talk, when you talk about silence, for me, um, it's returning back to that basic material, where you're, you know, you've collected all the sounds, and then, you know, yes, you could just stop. Like what happened in the uh, piece that I told you, the 18 Musicians, Music for 18 Musicians by Steve Reich where you know, all this um, sounds has been cre accumulated and um, collected in your head for almost an hour and suddenly it stops. 
And when it stops, that silence, well, I don't su- I, I, I suppose it's not really silence because the echoes of the sound is still ringing and I can still mm. remember that um, ex- experience very well still, even though it's so many years ago. For me, that that is really something um, emotional, an ec- mm. emotional experience that I really like about the music of uh, the minimalist writing mm. is this simple, basic um, idea with the repetition and then when it completely stops, that that is actually very, very powerful. Mm. Yeah, I think there's something about this, um, the use of really simple material yeah. which speaks directly to human emotions yes, somehow. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, I raised it in one of the artworks which is forthcoming in the next exhibition, yes. the Janet Cardiff piece. Right. Before the choir starts to sing, there's a moment where they're just engaged in kind of like general chit-chat. Mm-hmm. And then the conductor prepares everybody and there's a moment of silence. This is an incredibly powerful moment. Yes. And it's it's for me, it's like the the moment when when May E started to May E is our mutual yes, friend. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, when, before she started to play herringbone, there's that moment of preparation, which carries with it an mm-hmm. extraordinary kind of moment of anticipation. Yeah, and it, it I, I, for me as a a listener to music or someone who appreciates music. That's a very important part of the live performance. Yes. So uh, I'm intrigued to know to what extent the kind of um, the chance operation, if you like, if we want to use a Cajun mm-hmm. term, the chance operations that happen in live performance, that's something that you take into consideration when you're composing. Yes and no. <laughs> For me, uh, I like to have control of my music. I haven't written anything yet that gives the performer full authority mm. of um, what to do. But I plan, sometimes I plan those silences where I know that you know the performer needs time to prepare. But it's not out of a kind of um, free choice mm. but you know it's planned and for example if you know it's, it's talk, talking about technicality of let's say we go back to the piano piece that Mayi played mm. you know it becomes super super um, virtuosic and suddenly she or she or any pianist would need to take a break and that silence is actually calculated for me and then you know after that the next section happens or you know anything else happens so for me, I have not gone to that um, uh, that period in my composing yet, where I have given um, you know this kind of uh, freedom for the performer yet. Mm. Not yet, but who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? You know that could happen. <laughs> yeah. So, some of the things that in both our presentations, yes, we use these descriptors of texture, uh, tone color which are applicable to both visual art and music Uh, and for me I have no clue how you manifest these uh, nuances Mm -hmm. in the composition I I understand it when I see it in a visual artwork but maybe you can explain for the people who are more visually inclined how those things translate for you yeah so I mean you know as a composer, I've studied music for a long time, so you know what you're talking about harmony, melody, uh, sorry, not harmony, texture, material, mm. you know, that definitely translates from the visual world into music for sure. And so these are materials that is given to us as musicians. We've been taught for the past um, many years, you know, as a student, you learn about harmony and melody. But to me, as a composer, it's what you do with those. Um, uh, materials that you've been given and how do you create it to be your own so let's take for example that's why I really liked the um, Kusama painting because even though it's just dots it's the uh, the repetitive motion of those dots that gives it texture so you know it's it's a very simple um, movement 
that creates a profound um, mm. uh, result to me. And when I look at that piece of uh, art, you know, I, it, it just gives me that kind of imagination into my um, whole sound or what I can do with just, you know, maybe one note. And that note becomes uh, full of different um, uh, textures in terms of you know how um, many instruments are playing that note. So it creates that kind of lush texture to it, and that's how you know I I view that painting, which is simple but yet complex. So it's really how you know you want how complex you want it to be, mm. or how simple you want it to be. Mm. You know. So yeah, I'm I'm I was intrigued that you picked up on Zhang Yu's artwork as one of yes. the things that really spoke to you from the exhibition. Yes, yes. And um, I thought to just draw your attention to some other of his works. Yes, Because please. other works of his uh, involve him simply touching a piece of paper. Right. That's it. And the moisture from his finger might leave an indentation on the paper. That's it. There's nothing more to it. And maybe he repeats the gesture, mm -hmm. or maybe it's just one touch. Right. And I think that, you, you should check those works out, should. because yes. I think they will really speak to you as well. But going back to your interest in Kusama, you know that she is a very famous synesthete. So the, the separation between her senses is... Um, is not as clear as for most people. Mm. So when she hears sound, she sees pattern. Wonderful. So it's an extraordinary yes. kind of rever Re reversal yes. yeah. that in looking at her images, mm. you see sound. I can totally relate to that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just yeah. a really nice coincidence. Yes, yes. Um, I am intrigued to know what you think about... Um, how the future of composition might look. I mean, I'm oh. from the Art Science Museum. We're all about the future, Adeline. So <laughs> what, what, you know, it's these days, whether you're an instrumentalist, you're an expert in one particular instrument, or you're not a trained musician at all, yeah. the entire world of sound and noise and music is available to you through yeah. various technologies. Yes. So with... With all of that available to almost everybody who cares to tap into it, that's a huge challenge to work out what to make, yes. how to make it, how to create it, what's it going to be played on and why. Yeah. So how do you see the future of composition in light of all this uh, bountiful uh, material available? You know, that's a, it's a really good question, and that's exactly the same question I ask my composition students as well. You know, being a, a student these days is definitely very difficult compared to being students, you know, maybe during my time. Um, because the amount of information they have these days, it's, you know, they've got so much information, they know so much, I mean... Uh, the music world has uh, developed into something so um, enormous and, you know, for students and composers, almost nothing is original, I find, because it's been done, it's been heard. So what do you do um, uh, f trying to, you know, find your own voice? And yes, that remains the question still. But I do believe that, you know, every composer, you definitely have your own sound, you definitely have your own voice. And through all this uh, inform information of styles and sound you have right now, you have to find it within your own inner self to actually believe what is it that you really want. It just still comes back to the same question mm -hmm. that we ask ourselves, what, what is it that you are really interested in? You know, or, you know, what sound do you want to create? And perhaps, you know, it does not have to be um, something that's written out, like what you say. It could be some, something totally improvised, but what is it that you really want? So I think that is the beauty of being a composer. Mm. Hopefully you will find that that sound, hopefully you will have um, a journey that would lead you to that. And so, yes, you know, for me, that would be the advice is, or, you know, is to really just be honest with yourself. Mm. You know, you can listen to electronic pieces. You can listen to 
Bach, you can listen to Beethoven or you know, or Steve Reich or Philip Glass, minimalist pieces, but what is of interest to you and what is your unique sound? So mm. that is that is still remains to be the um, yes, the journey of a composer. And which is a magical journey because mm. you know you wanna continue to discover and for me I'm still discovering. So mm. yeah, I do enjoy that process very much. So, some of your we, we spoke about it before, and there's, there's some of your practice in terms of composition which uh, reminds me of the systems, mechanisms, formula, if you like, that uh, Judd have, has used in, his, in creating his work. So he sets himself some very specific frameworks yeah. within which he creates a work. There's a certain number of colors that he can work from, similarly with Carmen Herrera, actually. There's a set number of colors. There's a set size to the object. The colors are only available industrially, so they're house paint. Um, the materials are fabricated in a factory, so they're all unique. And within that, he has to use those kind of conditions in order to create something. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned that you have a similar yeah. approach. Yes, so we were talking about the objects and um, mm. how, you know, I have, again, we're coming back to the, the simple material, mm. all right? And for me, um, when I was looking at the Judd um, pieces, it has to do with chords for me and how I um, listen to chords. And, you know, if you look at, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier, how the different light reflects on that um, mm. stacks. Um, you, you have a totally different perception of it and where it's placed in the museum is also very different as well. Mm. So this is that kind of um, set uh, materials that I have, which are in this case the chords, but how I place those chords, how I uh, voice it, you know, it totally gives a different kind of impression towards that material being mm. used again. And um, for example, in the tuba and string quartet piece, I try to use the the five um, performers and I put them into different spaces and you know and when they play those notes you know in different spaces and different voicing it will sound very different mm. if you voice it differently as well so mm. yeah so I'm excited to discover how that work will go. So the, the tuba and strings composition yeah. that's still kind still, of being still, worked yeah, on. Yeah, in process, so yeah. The, when you eventually premiere it, the, you're thinking about physically distancing, yes. in a <laughs> post-COVID world, hopefully by then, uh, physically distancing the performers, uh, but also that the, it, it will kind of produce a different tonality. It's a different space different in terms space. of the sound. And then the when you record well. it, yeah. that, that will also be manifested yeah. through the recording also. Well, of course, you know, that we talk about, that's why, that's the beauty of real live performance where mm. you can actually hear and, you know, in this case, see that distance of how um, sound can actually be very different because mm. of the space. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm very keen to do yeah. with the upcoming exhibition is to encourage people of all places, types, knowledge, awareness, understanding, everything, that you know, music, no matter how complex it might seem, is there for everyone to appreciate. Definitely, yeah. And so the, you know, the exhibition is intended to give people different experiences of what music and sound can be, and also to give people the opportunity to create it for themselves in, in the simplest possible means, from clapping and stamping and whistling mm. to maybe attempting to write something. Right. It doesn't really matter, you know. You don't have to be able to write Western musical notation. You can just draw some patterns on a stave mm -hmm. and then uh, a musician of some accomplishment will be able to interpret that drawing of a, I don't know what, a snake on a stave yeah. if I drew it, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, someone would be able to interpret that as yeah, a composition. Definitely, or it could be a group of people coming together unknowingly looking at that drawing mm. and magically those group of, um, you know, your audience who's who's in that space, they kind of magically create that piece. I love, I love it. Yeah, I so that it. could definitely happen, you just never it. know. It. 
And we never know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian, for joining us this evening. And um, I think we're just about out of time. So I wish everyone a very good evening. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.